Hello my dear listeners. Welcome to Anjum's audiobook library. I was wondering how a good playlist can go without Haruki Murakami. It can't. So here it goes. Today I'll read a short story by Haruki Murakami named Kino. The man always sat in the same seat, the, st- the stool furthest down the counter, when it wasn't occupied, that is, but it was nearly always free. The bar was seldom crowded, and that particular seat was the most inconspicuous and the least comfortable. A staircase was in the back made the ceiling slanted and low, so it was hard to stand up there without bumping your head. The man was tall, yet for some reason preferred that cramped, narrow spot. Kino remembered the first time the man had come to his bar. His appearance had immediately caught Kino's eye. The bluish shaved head, the thin built yet broad shoulders, the keen glint in his eye, the prominent cheekbones and wide forehead. He looked to be in his early thirties and he wore a long grey raincoat, though it wasn't raining. At first, Kino tagged him as a Yakuja and was on his guard around him. It was 7.30, on a chilly mid-April evening, and the bar was empty. The man chose the seat at the end of the counter, took off his coat, and in a quiet voice ordered a beer, then silently read a thick book. After half an hour, finished with the beer. He raised his hand an inch or two to motion Kino over and ordered a whiskey. Which brand? Kino asked. But the man said he had no preference. Just an ordinary sort of scotch, a double, add an equal amount of water and a little bit of ice if you would. Kino poured some white level into a glass, added the same amount of water and two small nicely formed ice cubes. The man took a sip, scrutinized the glass and narrowed his eyes. This will do fine. He read for another half hour, then stood up and paid his bill in cash. He counted out exact change so that he couldn't get any coins back. Kino breathed a small sigh of relief as soon as he was out the door. But after the man had left his presence remained as Kino stood behind the counter, he glanced up occasionally at the seat that the man had occupied, half expecting him to still to be there, raising his hand a couple of inches to order something. The man began coming regularly to Kino's bar, once at most twice a week. He would invariably have a beer first, then a whiskey. Sometimes he would study the day's menu on the dashboard and order a light meal. The man hardly ever said a word. He always came fairly early in the evening, a book tucked under under his arm which he would place on the counter. Whenever he got tired of reading, at least Kino guessed that he was tired, he looked up from the page and studied the bottles of liquid lined up on the shelves in front of him, as if examining a series of unusual texty dominated animals from faraway lands. Once Kino got used to the man, though he never felt uncomfortable around him, even when it was just the two of them. Kino never spoke much himself and didn't find it hard to remain silent around others. While the man read, Kino did what he would do if he were alone, wash dishes, prepare sauce, choose records to play or page through the newspaper. He, Kino didn't know the man's name. He was just a regular customer who came to the bar, enjoyed a beer and a whiskey, read silently, paid in cash, then left. He never bothered anybody else. What more did Kino need to know about him? Back in college, Kino had been a standout middle distance runner. But in his junior year, he he had torn his Achilles tendon and had to give up on the idea of joining a corporate track team. After graduation, on his coach's recommendation, he got a job at a sports equipment company and he stayed there for 17 years 
at work, he was in charge of persuading sports stores to stock his brand of running shoes and leading athletes to try them out. The company, a mid-level firm headquartered in Okayama, was far from well-known and lacked the financial power of a Nike or an Adidas to drop exclusive contracts with the world's best runners. Still, it made and carefully handcrafted shoes for top athletes and quite a few swear by its products. Do an honest job and it will pay off, was the slogan of the company's founder and that low-key some, somewhat anachronistic approach suited Kino's personality. Even a taciturn, unso unsociable man like him was able to make a go of sales. Actually, it was become because of his personality that coaches trusted him and athletes took a liking to him. He listened carefully to each runner's needs and made sure that the head of manufacturing got all the details. The pay wasn't much to speak of, but he found the job engaging and satisfying. Although he couldn't run anymore himself, he loved seeing the runners race around the track. Their form textbook perfect. When Kino quit his job, it wasn't because he was dissatisfied with his work, but because he discovered that his wife was having an affair with his best friend at the company. Kino spent more time out on the road than at home in Tokyo. He'd stuff a large gym ball full of shoe samples and make the rounds of sporting goods stores all over Japan also visiting local colleges and companies that sponsored track teams. His wife and his colleagues, colleague started sleeping together while he was away. Kino wasn't the type who easily picked up on clues. He thought everything was fine with his marriage and nothing his wife said or did tipped him off to the contrary. If he hadn't happened to come home after a business trip a, year, a day early, he might never have discovered what was going on. When he got back to Tokyo that day, he went straight to his condo in Kasai, only to find his wife and his friend naked and entwined in his bedroom, in the bed where he and his, he and his wife slept. His wife was on top and when Kino opened the door, he came face to face with her and her lovely breast bouncing up and down. He was 39 then, his wife 35. They had no children. Kino lowered his head, shut the bedroom door, left the apartment and never went back. The next day, he quit his job. Kino had an unmarried aunt, his mother's older sister. Even since he was a child, his aunt had been nice to him. She'd had an old, older boyfriend for many years. Lover might be more accurate term. And he had generously given her a small house in Ioama. She lived on the second floor of the house and ran a coffee shop on the first floor. In front was a small garden and an impressive willow tree with low-hanging leafy bunches. The house was on a narrow back street behind the Nazo Museum, not exactly the best location for drawing customers, but his aunt had a gift for attracting people and her coffee shop did a decent amount of business. After she turned 60, though, he, she hurt her back and it became increasingly difficult for her to run the shop alone. She decided to move to a resort condo in the Izukogan Highlands. I was wondering if eventually you might want to take over the shop, she asked Kino. This was three months before he discovered his wife's affair. I appreciate the offer, he told her, but right now I'm happy where I am. After he submitted his resignation at work, he phoned his aunt to ask if she had sold the shop yet. It was listed with a real estate agent, she told him, but no serious offers had come in. I'd like to open a bar there if I can, Kino said. Could I pay your rent by the month? But what about your job? she asked. I quit a couple of days ago. Didn't your wife have a problem with that? We're probably going to get divorced soon. Kino didn't explain the reason and his aunt didn't ask. There was silence for a time on the other's other end of the line. Then his aunt named a figure for the monthly rent, 
far lower than what Kino had expected. I think I can handle that, he told her. He and his aunt had never talked all that much. His mother has discouraged him from getting close to her, but they'd always seemed to have a kind of mutual understanding. She knew that Kino wasn't the type of person to break a promise. Kino used half of his savings to transform the coffee shop into a bar. He purchased simple furniture and had a long sturdy bar installed. He put up new wallpaper in the coming color, brought his record collection from home and lined a shelf in the bar with LPs. He owned a decent stereo. He owned a decent stereo, a Thorin turntable, a Luxman amp and small JBL, two-way speakers and then he would brought what when she was single, a fairly extravagant purchase back then, but he had always enjoyed listening to old jazz records. It was his only hobby, one that he didn't share with anyone else he knew. In college, he had worked part-time as a bartender at a pub in Ropogne. So he was well versed in the art of mixing cocktails. He called his bar Kino. He couldn't come up with a better name. The first week he was open, he didn't have a single customer, but he wasn't perturbed. After all, he hadn't advertised the place or even put out an eye-catching sign. He simply waited patiently for curious people to stumble across the little back street bar. He, ha he still had some of his severance pay, and his wife hadn't asked for any financial support. He was always, already living with his former colleague, and she and Kino had decided to sell their condo in Kasai. Kino lived on the second floor of his aunt's house, and it looked as though for the time being he would be able to get by. As he waited for his first customer, Kino enjoyed listening to whatever music he liked and reading books he had been wanting to read. Like dry ground welcoming the rain, he let the solitude, silence and loneliness soak in. He listened to a lot of art, tattoo, solo, piano pieces. Somehow they seemed to fit his mood. He wasn't sure why but he felt no anger or bitterness towards his wife or the colleague she was sleeping with. The betrayal had been a shock. But as time passed, he began to feel as if it couldn't have been helped, as if this had been his fate all alone. In his life, after all, he had achieved nothing, had been totally unproductive. He couldn't make anyone else happy and, of course, couldn't make himself happy. Happiness? He wasn't even sure what that meant. He didn't have a, have a clear sense either of either of emotion like pain or anger, disappointment or resignation or how they were supposed to feel. The most he could do was create a place where his heart, devoid now of any depth or weight, could be tethered to keep it from wandering aimlessly. The little bar Kino tucked into a back street became that place and it became too not by design, exactly a strangely comfortable space. It wasn't a person who first discovered what a comfortable place Kino was, but a stray cat, a young grey female with a long lovely tail. The cat favoured a sunken display case in, the, in a corner of the bar and liked to curl up there to sleep. Kino didn't pay much attention to the cat, figuring it wanted to be left alone. Once a day, he fed it and changed its water, but nothing beyond that, and he constructed a small pet door so that it could go in and out of the bar whenever it liked. The cat may have brought some good luck along with it, for after it appeared so did a scattering of customers. Some of them started to come by regularly. Once, who took a lighting in this little back street bar with its wonderful old willow tree, its quite middle-aged owner, vintage records spinning on a turntable, and the grey cat sacked out in a corner. And these people sometimes brought out new customer, still far from tri triving. The bar at least aren't back at the rent. For Kino, that was enough. 
the young man with the shaved head started coming to the bar about two months after it opened. And it was another two months before Kinu learned his name, Kamita. It was raining lightly that day, the kind of rain where you aren't sure if you really need an umbrella. There was just three customers in the bar, Kamita and two men in suits. It was 7.30. As always, Kamita was the furthest stool down the counter, sipping a white label and water and reading. The two men were seated in a table, drinking a bottle of peanut noir. They had brought the bottle with them and asked Kino if he would mind their drinking it there for a 5,000 yen cork fee. It was first for Kino, but he had no reason to refuse. He opened the bottle and set down two wine glasses and a bowl of mixed nuts. Not much trouble at all. The two men smoked a lot though, which for Kino, who, ha who hated cigarette smoke, made them less welcome. With little else to do, Kino sat on a stool and listened to Coleman Hawking's LP with the track Joshua Fit the Battle of Zorico. Jericho. He found the boss solo by Major wholly amazing. At first, the two men seemed to be getting along fine, enjoying their wine. But then, a difference of opinion arose on some topic, on some topic or other. What it was, Kino had no idea, and the man grew steadily more worked up. At some point, one of them stood, tipping the table and sending the full astra and one of the wine glasses crashing to the floor. Kino hurried over with a broom, swept up the mess, and put a clean glass and ashtray on the table. Kamita thought at this time Kino had yet to learn his name, was clearly disgusted by the man's behavior. His expression didn't change, but he kept tapping the fingers of his left hand lightly on the counter, like a pianist checking the keys. I have to get this situation under control, Kino thought. He went over to the man. I'm sorry, he said politely, but I wonder if you'd mind keeping your voices down a bit. One of them looked up at him with a cold glint in his eye and rose from the table. Kino hadn't noticed it until now, but the man was huge. He wasn't so much tall as barrel chested with enormous arms and sort of built you'd expect of a solo sumo wrestler. The other man was much smaller, thin and pale, with a shrewd look, the type who was good at egging people on. He slowly got up from his seat too, and Kino found himself face to face with both of them. The man had apparently decided to use this opportunity to call a halt to their quarrel and jointly comfort Kino. They were perfectly coordinated, almost as if they had secretly been waiting for this very situation to arise. So, you think you can just butt in and interrupt us, the larger of two said, his voice hard and low. The suits they wore seemed expensive, but closer inspection showed them to be tacky and poorly made, not full-fledged yakuja, though with whatever work they were involved it was clearly not respectable. The larger man had a crew cut while his companion's hair was dyed brown and pulled back in a high ponytail. Kino stilled himself for something bad to happen. Sweat began to pour from his armpits. Pardon me, another voice said. Kino turned to find that Kamita was standing behind him. Don't blame the staff, Kamita said, pointing to Kino. I am the one who asked him to request that you keep it down. It makes it hard to concentrate and I can't read my book. Kamita's voice was calmer, more languid than usual, but something unseen was beginning to steer. Can't read my book, the smaller man repeated, as if making sure that there was nothing ungrammatical about the sentence. What, don't you get a home? The larger man asked Kamita. I do, Kamita replied. I live nearby. Then why don't you go home and read there? I like reading here, Kamita said. The two men exchanged a look. Hand over the book, the smaller man said, I'll read it for you. I'd like to read it myself quietly, Kamita said, and I'd hate it if you mispronounced any of the words. Aren't you a piece of work, the larger man said. What a funny guy. What's your name anyway, Ponytails asked. My name is Kamita, he said. It's written with the characters for God, Kami, 
and the field god's field but it wasn't pronounced kanda as you might expect it's pronounced kamita i remember that the large man said good idea memories can be useful kamita said anyway how about we step outside the smaller man said that way we can say exactly what you want to fine with me kamita said anywhere you say but before you do that could you pay your check you don't want to cause the bar any trouble kamita asked hino to bring over this their check and he laid exact change for his own drink on the counter ponytail extracted a 10000 yen bill from his wallet and tossed it onto the table i don't need any money back ponytail said kino but why don't you buy yourself some better wine glasses this is expensive wine and glasses like this make it taste like shit what a cheap joint the larger man said sneeringly correct a cheap bar with cheap customers kamita said it doesn't suit you there is got to be somewhere else that does not that i know where now aren't you the wise guy the li- the large man said you make me laugh think it over later on and have a good long laugh kamita said no way you are going to tell me where i should go ponytail said he slowly licked his lips like a snake sneezing up spray the large man opened the door and stepped outside ponytail following behind perhaps sensing the tension in the air the cat despite the rain leaped outside after them are you sure you are okay kino asked kamita not to worry kamita said with a slight smile you don't need to do anything mr kino just stay put this will be over soon kamita went outside and shut the door it was still raining a little harder than before kino sat down on a stool and waited it was oddly still outside and he couldn't hear a thing kamita's book lay open on the counter like a well trained dog waiting for its master up about 10 minutes later the door opened and in strode kamita alone would you mind lending me a towel he asked kino handed him a fresh towel and kamita wiped his head then his neck face and finally both hands thank you everything is okay now he said the two won't be showing their faces egg here again what in the world happened kamita just shook his head as if to say better you don't know he went over to sit down the rest of his whiskey and picked up where he had left off in his book later that that evening after kamita has gone kino went outside and make a circuit of the neighborhood the alley was deserted and quiet no signs of a fight no trace of blood he couldn't imagine what had taken place he went back to the bar to wait for other customers but no one else came that night the cat didn't return either he poured himself some white label and added an equal amount of water and two small ice cubes and tasted it nothing special about what you'd expect but that night he needed a shot of alcohol in his system about a week after that incident kino slept with a female customer she was the first woman she'd like she'd had sex and with since he left his wife she was 30 or perhaps a little older he wasn't sure if she would be classified as beautiful but there was something unique about her something that stood out the women had been to the bar several times before always in the company of a man of about the same age who wore tortoise shell framed glasses and bit bitnik like what he had unruly hair and never wore a tie so kino figured he was probably not your typical company employee the women always wore a tight fitting dress that showed off her slender sharp shapely figure they sat at the bar exchanging an occasional husked word or two as they sipped cocktails or sherry they never stayed long kino imagined they were having a drink before they made love or else after he couldn't say which but the way they drank remained him reminded him of sex drowned out intense sex the two of them were strangely expressionless especially the women whom kino had never seen smile she spoke to him sometimes always about the music that was playing she liked jazz and he was collecting lps herself my father used to learn to the music at home she told him hearing it brings back a lot of memories From her to Kino couldn't tell if the memories was of the music or her of father but he couldn't venture to ask 
became actually tired not to have too much to do with the women. It was clear that the man wasn't very pleased when he was friendly to her. One time he and the women did have a lengthy conversation, exchanging tips on used record stored in Tokyo and the best way to take care of Vinay. And after all, the man kept scooting him cold, suspicious looks. Kino was usually careful to keep his distance from any sort of entanglement. Nothing was worse than jealousy and pride, and Kino had had a number of awful experiences before one or the other. It struck him at times that there was something about him that stayed up the dark side of other people. That night, though, the women came to the bar alone. There were no other customers, and when she opened the door, cool night air crept in. She sat on the counter, ordered a brandy, and asked Kino to play some Beatle Holiday. Some Billy Holiday. Something really old, if you could. Kino put a Columbia record on the turntable. One with the track, Georgia on my mind. The two of them listened silently. Could you play the other side too? She asked. When it ended, she did as she requested. She slowly worked her way through three brandies, listening to a few more records. Errol Garner's Moon Low, Buddy D. Francis, I Can't Get Started. At first, Kino thought she was waiting for the man, but she didn't glance at her watch even once. She just sat there, listening to the music, lost in thought, sipping her brandy. Your friend isn't coming today, Kino decided to ask to closing time dear new. As closing time drew near, he isn't coming, he's far away, the woman said. See, she stood up from the stool and walked over to where the cat lies sleeping. She gently stroked its back with her fingertips. The, can, the cat, unperturbed, went on sleeping. We're thinking of not seeing each other anymore, the woman said. Kino didn't know how to respond. So he said nothing and continued to straighten up behind the counter. I'm not sure how to put in. How to put it, the woman said. She stopped petting the cat and went back to the bar, high heels clicking. Our relationship isn't exactly mm, normal. Not exactly normal, Kino repeated her words without really considering what that meant. She finished the small amount of brandy left in her glass. I have something I'd like to show you, Mr. Kino, she said. Whatever it was, Kino didn't want to say it, of that she was certain, but she didn't manage to produce the words to say so. The woman removed her cardigan and placed it on the stool. She reached both hands behind her and unzipped her dress. She turned her back to Kino. Just below her white bra clasped, he saw an irregular sparkling of marks the color of faded charcoal, like breezes. Like breezes, they reminded him of the constellation of the winter sky, a dark row of deep, deep-plated stars. The woman said nothing, just displays her bare back to Kino, like someone who cannot even comprehend the meaning of the question he had been asked. Kino just stared at the marks. Finally, she zipped up and turned to face him. She put on her cardigan and fixed her hair. There are Sigurd's worms, she said simply. Kino was at loss for words, but she had to say something. Who did that to you, she asked. His voice Parched. The women didn't reply. Kino realized that he wasn't hoping for an answer. I have them in other places too, she said finally, her voice drained of expression. Places that are a little hard to show. Kino had felt from the first that there was something out of the ordinary about the women. Something had triggered an intrinsic, intrinsic response, warning him not to get involved with her. He was basically a cautious person. If he really needed to sleep with the women, he could always make do with a professional, and it wasn't as if he had he were ever even attracted to this women. But that night she desperately wanted a man to make love to her, and it seemed that he was the man. Her eyes was depthless. The pupils strangely delayed but there was a decisive glitter in them that would brook no retreat. 
Kinu didn't have a power to resist. He looked up the bar and the two of them went upstairs in the bedroom. The women quickly took off her dress, peeled off her underwear and showed him the places that were a little hard to show. Kinu couldn't help averting his eyes at first and then was drawn back to look. He couldn't understand nor did he, nor did he want to understand. The mind of a man who would do something so cruel or of a woman who would willingly endure it. It was a savage scene from a barren planet, lights, light years away from where Kiro lived. The woman took his hand and guided it to the scars, making him touch each one in turn. There were scars on her breast and inside, beside her vagina. He traced those dark, hard marks as if he were using a pencil to connect the dots. The marks seemed to seemed to form a shape that reminded him of something, but he couldn't think what it was. They had sex on the tatami floor, no words exchanged, no foreplay, no time even to turn off the light or lay out the futon. The woman's tongue slid down his throat, his knee, her nails dug into his back. Under the light, like two starving animals, they devoured the flesh they craved. When dawn began to show outside, they crawled onto the futon and slept, as if dragged down into darkness. Kina awoke just before noon and the woman was gone. He felt as if he had had a very realistic dream. But of course, he hadn't been a dream. His back was lined with scratches his arms with bite marks, his penis wrung by a dull ache, severe long black hair swelled around his white pillow, and shit had a long scent he had never smelled before. The women came to bar several times after that, always with the goated man, with the goated man. They would sit in the corner counter speak in subdued voices as they drank a cocktail or two and then leave. The women would exchange a few words with Kino, mostly about music. Her tone was the same as before, as if she had no memory of what had been taken place between them that night. The next part of the story will be uploaded soon. Till then, listen to your best friend, that is book, and please subscribe to get update of the latest uploads.